second part of this morning uh, is dedicated to a, compl uh, a complement to what we have seen so far in the analysis of project finance. So far, our idea has been uh, work on a qualitative basis in identifying basically the two basic dimensions of the deal. The first one is the parties involved, the second one is the risks that must be allocated. But at the end, very end, uh, the problem uh, becomes uh, a problem of quantifying what the project will generate in the future. Because at the end, if I have to ask some form of financing to either my sponsors or banks, I will have basically to identify how much money the deal will absorb and how much money the deal will generate. And uh, the basic uh, problem is exactly how much money will be generated and produced. And so the problem is to identify the cash flows that the project will generate. In this sense, when we are valuing the cash flows deriving from the project, the exercise is a classic capital budgeting exercise. We have to evaluate whether a project is uh, convenient from an economic point of view, and uh, financially sustainable from the financial point of view. Uh, the remaining part of our course uh, is dedicated to this important topic. So from this point onward, uh, we transform the analysis from the qualitative point of view into a more structured and quantitative uh, uh, perspective, pers uh, viewpoint. Uh, that's why this second part is dedicated to a first introduction, a very first introduction, to the principles of capital budgeting in project finance transactions. Uh, the problem of capital budgeting is not particularly different from the general rules of capital budgeting that you have learned in your past courses in corporate finance or stuff like that. There are indeed some uh, peculiar features of a project finance because the valuation of uh, the sustainability of a project finance is based partially on uh, the basic principles of corporate finance and partially are very specific to this kind of deal. Uh, I will start by saying that in order to give an okay to a project finance transaction and so in order to give a, a green light to the uh, carrying out uh, of a project finance, we have to cope with two basic criteria. The first one is the analysis of the profitability of the deal. Uh, and uh, as I will show you, there is nothing new about profitability compared to what you have seen in your past courses in corporate finance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the news uh, arises when we have to analyze the second criteria that must be met in order to give green light to a project finance deal. And this second criteria is uh, the criteria of the financial sustainability of the deal. Uh, in terms of profitability, uh, the idea is uh, very simple. If we go back to the analysis of uh, the cash flow behavior during the life of a project, and uh, so our classic slope of cash flow, cumulative cash flows, uh, this is uh, the cumulative value of free cash flow, we have seen that the first part, the construction phase, is occupied by the uses of fund. funds that are withdrawn from bank lines of credit and that are taken uh, from the equity contributions by sponsors. So the first part is represented by equity contribution and it is represented by loan withdrawal. In this part of the life of the project, the project is not able to generate cash. It can only absorb cash from either banks or sponsors. After the commercial operating date and after the test of the plant, arguably, hopefully, 
uh, the project should be able to generate the money to repay back either the lenders in first instance and uh, sponsors in terms of dividends. And so, uh, from a financial point of view, equity contribution will find remuneration during the operation phase in the form of dividends and uh, loan withdrawals will find uh, a form of reimbursement in terms of principal repayment and interest payment. Okay? In this sense, what financial modelists try to identify when putting out financial models for project finance is, uh, in the perspective of uh, shareholders, to identify the profile of the deal in terms of either equity contributions and dividend payments. So, the payoff for a shareholder will be, during construction, the equity contribution. And, during operation, the dividend payments. This uh, from uh, a strict point of view of an equity provider without considering the fact that the sponsor can also play a role as a contractor, as an operator, as an off-taker, and so without considering that this profile can be much more complex, particularly when, take the case of Alpha. Alpha performs more than one role and so it can get from the project not only the flows of dividends, but also flows coming from uh, the different contracts he has signed with uh, the special purpose vehicle. In this sense, if I'm able to modelize uh, either the equity contribution and the dividend payments, I can get immediately one uh, summary uh, measure of the profitability of this project. And this measure is uh, the so-called IRR equity. It is that interest rate that equals to zero the present value of the negative flows discounted to present and of the positive flows discounted to present. Nothing new. Absolutely not new. Okay? Obviously, every sponsor will compare this IRR with the cost of funding for the financing of this deal. And uh, as you know, from standard corporate finance, I accept the project rather when the IRR is higher than the cost of capital, and I will reject the project uh, when the IRR is lower than the cost of capital. Very easy. And that cost of capital is the weight and average cost of capital for every space. Quite easy. Good. And uh, of course, when a financial modelist models the project finance, the first uh, uh, criteria that is to be met is exactly this one. If the IRR is, uh, isn't sufficiently high to compensate for the risk of the sponsors, this deal is not feasible, simply because it isn't uh, sufficiently profitable. Okay? So the first okay for the deal must come from the sponsors. If the IRR for the sponsor is too low, the operation, the deal, will not be carried out. Okay? So the first condition is that sponsors must say, OK, uh, I agree to carry out the project. OK of sponsors. On the other hand, the same uh, cash flow profile can be designed uh, according to the different variables included into the financial model for lenders. Also lenders present a payoff of this kind because exactly as it happens for um, equity contributors, also banks will be called to provide money during the construction phase. And so you are here, loan withdrawals, and they will recover their funds through the repayment that is agreed between the special purpose vehicle and the banks. In this case, this profile is uh, not variable, like in the case of dividends, it is not receivable. This is fixed, because this is a scheduled repayment for Italians, piano di ammortamento, 
that is agreed from the very beginning between the special purpose vehicle and uh, the lenders that are lending money to the project. Okay? Yeah. In this case, what I can get from this payoff distribution of cash flows is exactly another summary indicator of profitability. It is the IRR for banks. And also IRR for banks must be compared with an appropriate cost of funding. And again, if the IRR for banks is higher than the cost of funding that the banks have borne in order to carry out the project, uh, the project will be feasible. On the other hand, if the IRR is too low, the OK of banks will not arrive and we will have to work out some other form of financing in order to enhance the level of uh, uh, IRR for banks. So the second OK must go in terms of profitability by banks, OK of banks. I don't want to go in more that on the problem of cost of funding for banks. But for those of you who have attended courses in bank management or stuff like that, I simply remember that the cost of funding for banks must include not only the cost of uh, deposits, basically, interbank deposits, but also the capital absorption that, according to Basel II rules, uh, absorb equity capital. And so it is sort of weighted average cost of capital, also for banks. Okay? In any case, remember, it is not the only cost of deposit. The bank finances every deal with a part of deposit and a part of equity. And that part of equity must be accounted for with an internal rating based system. Okay? And uh, so far, nothing seems very different compared to the standard corporate finance literature. Things uh, are different uh, from the second point of view financial sustainability. Because here we have to include some news in our valuation. Uh, admitting for a moment uh, that the IRR equity is uh, satisfying for equity holders and that IRR for banks is satisfying for banks, uh, this is not sufficient to give green light to the project because the problem becomes an exquisite problem of valuating how much cash do I have in order to repay and this is not a capital budgeting exercise. So, the two conditions must be met, but even though the two conditions are met, these are not sufficient in order to give green light to the project. We now have to pass to the problem of financial sustainability. And you will see that financial sustainability has nothing to do with either MPV or IRR. It is a, a totally, comple completely different universe. Okay? Uh, how can I get financial sustainability? It is quite easy. Uh, financial sustainability is uh, basically uh, based again on the analysis of cash flows. So again, we are analyzing the capacity of uh, the ability of the project to generate cash again. Uh, just to make things clear, if I talk about the concept of free cash flow. Is everybody on the ball? Is everybody on board? Hmm? Free cash flow is basically uh, the, determined by operational cash flows, cash flow coming from activity, investments in working capital, and investment in fixed assets, also known as capex, capital expenditures. Uh, in this sense, one of the first things we can say is, let's summarize in a very simple way uh, what happens in a normal uh, firm, in an already in place firm, when we calculate the free cash flow of a firm. Very, in a very simplified way, I think that you can agree with me that the free cash flow is calculated, uh, deducting from the value of revenues, the level of operating costs uh, this is basically called EBITDA earning before interest, taxes and depreciation and amortization to EBITDA uh, usually when you have learned this from your standard corporate finance course 
you deduct taxes on EBIT, please, guy, uh, look at this case. Taxes are calculated on EBIT, not on EBIT. Which is the difference between EBIT and EBIT? Depreciation. Uh, depreciation is tax deductible. So yeah, I have to deduct depreciations for EBIT, calculate EBIT, calculate taxes on EBIT, and then resum the depreciation. I have uh, simplified this. So I haven't gone through EBIT and calculate taxes. I simply indicate taxes on EBIT. Okay? From this, I deduct or I sum, according to the sign, the change in working capital. And then, according to the sign, supposing, for example, that I have no capital dismissal or capital sales, I can only include a minus sign with capital expenditures, capex. So new plant and equipment, uh, new plant and machinery, uh, new shares uh, bought in uh, controlled firms, uh, etc. Question over there? Question? No? Okay. Uh, this is actually the unlevered free cash flow, meaning the free cash flow calculated before financial items. Unlevered free cash flow. Now, guys, a question for you. This is an already in place firm. Now, consider, for example, the cogeneration one case, and let help me calculating the free cash flow of cogeneration one during construction. So you are in one of the month of the first forty months, and I want to ask you. Uh, how the free cash flow will look like during one of these 40 months in cogeneration one. Do I have a bid for the first 40 months? Do I have taxes on EBIT during the first 40 months? Do I have working capital during the first 40 months? Receivables, payables, inventories? No, the plant is not being built. Which is the only item that contributes to the generation of free cash flow during the first 40 months? CapEx. The only value is CapEx because I am building up the cogeneration facility and according to the different milestones I will see an increase in CapEx year by year until the reaching the 40th month with the testing period. So during construction free cash flow is simplifying to minus Capex. This is one of the key differences between an already in place firm and a project finance. In a project finance, you have a very definite phase where you absorb cash and you only have capex. And you have a well defined phase where capex falls to zero because the plant now is built and you get all the money back in terms of either a bid or change in working capital. Very easy. No, absolutely not. It is not necessary. What? Yes, uh, Giovanni, it's like to say, is it uh, uh, obvious for you to start depreciating one piece of work if that facility is not completed? No. You are, don't have depreciation. You can start depreciating a facility only when the facility is operating. So at the end of the construction period. Okay. During operation, cogeneration one, during operation. <clears throat> Can you help me building up the cash flows during operation? Please. Yes, and all the plant will be able to operate as a unit only at the end of the 40th month. That's why I go on purchasing pieces of material, stuff, etc. But all this stuff will be capitalized into the value of the plant and the plant will be amortized only at the end of the construction period when 
the plant will uh, start performing basically. Okay, good. During operations, let's start. Which are the sources of revenue for cogeneration one? Which are the sources? From, uh, from which do I derive my sources of value? What does uh, cogeneration one sell on the market? Okay, revenues from steam and revenues from energy. Revenues from energy and revenues from steam. Okay, let's have a look now to the operating costs. Which costs do, uh, does uh, cogeneration one bear? Which cost? Look at the business model. We have analyzed so far the case, so you know it. Raw material purchase, okay, cost of raw materials. Cost for raw materials, okay. What else? You pay alpha for operation and maintenance, so the operation and maintenance fee for carrying out day by day operation and maintenance, so cost for O&M. Cost for ONM. Okay. Uh, what else? If I have insurance in place, premium for insurance, insurance premiums, minus insurance premiums. What else? Compare this one and this one. Taxes. Pay attention to one fact. We are not analyzing capital budgeting now. We are analyzing how much cash I have. And taxes are not calculated on EBIT. Taxes are calculated on EBIT on, sorry, earning before taxes. So here, when we pass to the analysis of how much cash I have, for how much cash do I have to spend, I'm not interested in an exercise of a capital budgeting with taxes on EBIT. I'm interested in knowing how much cash I have to pay for taxes. And taxes are calculated, as it happens, on earning before taxes. So, taxes, for sure, but taxes on ABT, non-ABIT. Taxes on EBT. I repeat, I'm not interested in discounting anything here. So, if I don't discount anything, it is not important for me to split the taxes into taxes on EBIT and taxes on financial charges. I simply want to calculate how much cash I have to spend for taxes. And taxes, real taxes, are calculated on EBT, not EBIT. Okay? Sufficiently clear for you? Yeah. Now, plus or minus change in working capital. Do I have further capital expenditures during operations? I have only one piece of plant, cogeneration one. Do I have to spend something more for other capital expenditures? No. The plant is there for 20 years. At the end of 20 years, I close it and I dismiss it. One piece of plant, only one, the project. And so free cash flow is exactly this one. Free cash flow during operation. Now guys, uh, let's summarize what we have seen so far. From a, a modelist point of view, uh, the situation is very simple. During operation, during construction, sorry, I don't have cash to repay anything. I absorb cash and I need money from banks and equity holders. During operation, free cash flow is the cash that is uh, generated by the project. For every year, this is the cash available for payments to creditors and to shareholders. So this is cash available. Okay. So... Uh, from a point of view of the modelist, since a modelist works basically with Excel files and Excel sheets, so far his idea has been, or her idea, uh, has been to modelize 
at least four big building blocks. The first one is the modelization of the cost of capital expenditures. So the first thing you have to modelize is the cost of capex, cost of investment. The second building block you have to modelize is the value of revenues. For all the years the project will be performing. Revenues. And these guys uh, are building blocks uh, representing each one sheet of an Excel file. So every sheet is dedicated to the analysis of a specific part of your project. The third one, I have to modelize the costs, the operating costs of the project. Operating costs. And finally, I have to modelize taxes. You will see we will see, when we will analyze financial models in project finance, that the calculation is uh, obviously interconnected. I can't calculate taxes unless you don't get the profit and loss. But you can't get the profit and loss unless you have calculated the free cash flow. And so the analysis is interconnected. And there are some forms of circularities. We will see them when we will analyze models. At the end, uh, cost of investment, revenues, operating costs and taxes contributes to the definition of free cash flow. And we have seen that free cash flow is the cash available for every year of operation. On the other hand, cash available must be matched with the cash needed every year to repay, you remember, dividends to sponsors and before dividends to sponsors capital and interest to lenders. In turn, capital and interest to lenders is determined basically to the choice, is determined by the choice that the arranger has made in terms of how much debt and how much equity I will use for this, uh, for this project basically. And, into, and uh, not only how much debt and how much equity I will have, but also the cost of that, and above all, the scheduled repayment. How much of this debt I will repay here by here, the piano di ammortamento. Hmm? Cost of debt and repayment schedule. Based on cost of debt and repayment schedule, I should be able to determine the debt service. I mean, how much debt and how much interest I will repay here by here to the lenders. It is quite easy. In your mathematical finance course, you have learned how to amortize a loan. The outstanding will decrease here by here, and I will calculate the interest based on the outstanding of the <coughs> previous year, or the previous semester, or the previous month, or whatever you want. This is the debt service. And uh, once you have decided that this is the debt service, that you have agreed with your lenders, debt service is the cash needed every year and it is strictly needed because once you have agreed to repay that amount you can't renegotiate it is not a flexible payment once you have decided this must be paid okay and so this is the cash needed by the project cash needed the ultimate valuation we, we, we must uh, perform in order to evaluate if the project is sustainable from the financial point of view is exactly this one. Compare cash available with cash needed and a project is financially viable only when cash available is strictly higher than cash needed. Strictly higher. There must be a safety cushion between the first one and the second one. Otherwise, bank will be more than reluctant to provide you funds. I don't know if it is clear. It is really simple. Okay? I don't know if you got the point. 
Uh, I complete this scheme because actually this is how uh, a financial modelist work, adding to this uh, uh, scheme what we have seen in terms of risk analysis and risk allocation. Just one point. In your opinion, if I have been able with my lawyers to identify all the sources of risk, risk analysis, and to allocate these risks to all the parties that are able to be at them, obviously, with a payment, for sure. In your opinion, the volatility of cash flows exposed compared to the ex ante analysis of flow will be high or low? Will be very low. And if uh, the cash flows coming from the project have a very low volatility, can I use higher level of debt or lower level of debt? Higher, because the financial risk can be borne if the project is very sound. And so, in turn, that equity ratio is determined by all the process of risk analysis and risk allocation that we have performed so far. The idea is the better the risk analysis and the location, the higher the debt, the debt equity ratio. The higher the debt service, so the final check will be free cash flow are sufficiently, first, rich, second, stable, in order to sustain that debt service. If the answer is yes, that capital structure is feasible and the project financing is financially viable. Okay? Sufficiently clear for you? Pay attention, I haven't used MPV, I haven't used IRR because financial sustainability has nothing to do with profitability. It's another completely different story. Okay? This is one piece of information that in standard corporate finance and books is not included because it is not profitability. Okay? There was a question over there. Yes, even though we make good risk analysis Risk allocation, you can experience in the market for some kind of materials as we experienced for the oil in the 70s, the, the sharp increase, and nobody could have predicted. Mm -hmm. What happened then? And this is the crucial thing, crucial thing to, to maintain your production. Yeah. You ask for more loans. Mm -hmm. You ask for more loans, unfortunately. Project finance is a closed the deal. Once you have closed, you can only have some form of contingency, 10%, 15% more. But once you have exhausted also contingency, money is over. And so you then have nothing more. So the ideal situation is if you want, as a lender, to protect yourself against unexpected swings, for example, in oil prices, the only thing you can do is to ask for every year, an amount of cash available, ex ante, that is much larger than the cash needed. So to have a safety cushion that can absorb unexpected swings in raw material prices, cost of uh, maintenance, uh, cost of ancillary facilities, and so on and so forth. The only thing you can do is to be very restricted in the analysis of the financial sustainability. Okay? you will ask a very big difference between the two and will not be satisfied when this difference is very low. It is the only solution you can have. Okay? I don't know if I've answered to your question. Now I will try to be more clear. Any, any other question about this? I think it is very simple. Okay? Cash available versus cash needed. This is uh, actually the conditions that must be met in order to give an okay in terms of financial sustainability. If this sign is uh, minor then, this solution is not viable. Okay? Uh, two questions for you. The first one. Suppose that this, uh, this equation is not met. And so, cash available in a certain year is minor than cash needed in that year. The problem is uh, the product <coughs> in this way is not financially sustainable. Obviously, if you are an arranger or an advisor, before giving up the mandate, 
you will try to work out every possible solution in order to recover the situation. So, to bring the project to be able to satisfy the disequation, cash available higher than cash needed. You will try everything. You will give up the mandate only when you have tried everything and this, this equation is always unmet, unsatisfied. So my question for you is, suppose that in one year, or more than one year, and the situation is worse, cash available is uh, lower than cash needed. Which are the possible solutions? You can, as an arranger, negotiating with the sponsors and the other counterparties included in the deal, try to recover this favorable situation. Solutions. Let's have some brainstorming. I can help you. I give only one suggestion. Solutions can be solutions acting on the financial side of the deal or on the real side of the deal, being the second much more difficult than the first one. Let's start with the financial solutions. You have this uh, building block scheme and you have found a solution that is not met. What you can do in order to recover the situation? Let's start with the financial side of the deal. Yes, the first one, reduce the level of debt to equity ratio. If you reduce debt to equity ratio, you have two effects. The, oh, sorry, uh, financial side. The ratio, lower. Which effect? The first one, obvious. The repayment of loans will be lower, and the interest paid will be lower. So debt service will be lower. All of the things equal. So, higher contribution of equity. And in this case, uh, the crucial point will be the negotiation with sponsors. You are acting as a banker. You are acting as a banker. As a banker, the first thing you ask to your sponsors, please provide me more equity. Hmm? Okay. Suppose that myself as a sponsor will say, no way, man. This is the amount of money provided, no, one, no euro more, no euro less. No more money available. So let's try to find out any other solution. Squeeze your brain. So, that equity ratio is fixed. I can't move it. What, what else can I move? Look at the block schedules. Giovanni. Uh, for example, what do you mean? For example, I can modify the repayment schedule. Not necessarily a bullet. For example, I can try to modify the percentage repayment here by here in order to met the payments with the swing in the cash flows. So one possibility is to modify the repayment schedule. Repayment schedule. I will show an example just in a couple of minutes. Repayment schedule. Other solutions. Suppose that I have modified all the repayment schedule uh, in, let's say, seven years, the original tenor, the duration of the loan, and I've tried everything, but again, the, this equation is not met. What can, I, what can I do? Instead of repaying the banks in seven years, I can ask bank to be repaid in, let's say, ten years, and so I reduce the amount of money I have to repay here by here. Uh, lengthening of the tenor. Hmm? Tenor lengthening. Tenor increase. Tenor is a, a synonym for duration. Tenor increase. And obviously, here the OK must come from banks. What else? What else? More and more difficult. One thing is to remodulate. One thing is to ask for an enlargement of the tenor, much more difficult. Uh, if a credit committee asks for engagement in seven years, uh, it is not open to lend money in ten years, much more difficult. What else? <coughs> Cost of debt. You are proposing me Euribor plus 125. Let's try to negotiate Euribor plus 115. Very difficult, but I can try as an arranger. Tenor increase. 
reduction of interest rate, KD, is lower down. So you can try all the possibilities before giving up your mandate. If you give up the mandate, you are not get paid as an arranger. Okay? Possible solution, uh, and uh, you have exhausted all the possibilities. Apart from this, look at the variables. You don't have much more to do. Okay? Let's have a, a look to the real side of the deal. So, you have tried everything with sponsor. No way, man. You have started to negotiate with banks. No way. I'm stuck on my position. What else can I do? I can move to the sources of value of the project. The free cash flow. What can I do? For example, remember, most part of the sponsors are strictly related to the generation of cash flows because they are either constructors, suppliers, purchasers, of takers, operators, and so they are exactly the counterparties you have to negotiate with. What you can do? Give me some ideas. Any idea? Suppose that myself, I am a contractor. <coughs> the arranger comes to me and say, are you sure that the cost of the construction is exactly 1 billion euros? Let's try to review the estimate and see if you can reduce some form of payment. After all, you are a contractor but also a sponsor. And so your final payoff will be the cost of construction and the value of dividends. It's your interest to renegotiate with me. So, maybe one possibility is look at these and, for example, reduce construction costs. When we will have the business game in this class, these are all variables you can modify in a financial plan in order to reach the desired combination. And so pay attention because these are sensitivities or scenarios that you can build up. Other possibility, move on. What we can do with this one? Revenues. What I can, go, what I can do? I can go to the off-taker and say, why don't you increase a little bit more the revenues? Or I can go to the public administration and say, hey guy, I can't build up this hospital with such a low level of tariff. Please renegotiate it, otherwise the economic sustainability of this project is not viable. And so, review tariffs, for example. Or, maybe, if you go to the, one of the suppliers or the operator, review key contracts for costs. Raw material supply agreement, operation and maintenance agreement, and so on and so forth. Review key contracts for costs. Review key contracts for costs. Okay? Operation and maintenance, basically, and supply agreement. Only when you have exhausted every possibility, you are really at a standstill. In this moment, the arrangers say, I'm not able to organize a project finance, and so I return the mandate, and I unfortunately don't receive the compensation, the success fee for the organization. Sufficiently clear for you how this building block works? And that these building blocks work very easily when you have a financial model, because every assumption can be modified. And uh, you run different set of scenarios in order to see at the end whether this situation is met or not. Okay? Sufficiently clear? If it is clear, now we can move one step forward and uh, having a careful look as how to, we can measure from a point of view of financial covenants. Remember, we have still to analyze financial covenants, cover ratios. This is exactly what we are trying to do now. Look again. The problem is to measure the difference between cash available and cash needed. Go back one step to the cash flows during operations. Free cash flow is determined by these variables during operations. Now my question for you is, free cash flow can be used every year in order to pay what? So, if these are the sources of the free cash flow, which are the uses of fund during operation? 
So let's use this bottom part of uh, our whiteboard and see what happens uh, below the free cash flow. I use the free cash flow every year operation in order to do what? Look again at the block schedule. Don't be shy. It is obvious. It is so obvious that it seems so stupid. But anyway, what you can do with your cash, free cash flow? Pay interest. And after the payment of interest, to pay? Capital. Okay. So, first of all, I repay. Interest on that. For the moment, I suppose I have only one seniority of debt, only senior debt. We will see in the proceeding of this course that we can use also subordinated loan. But for the moment, let's keep things simple. Minus capital repayment, a repayment of loans, of loans. Okay, let's now write this row, if there is a positive difference, hopefully, there is a positive difference between the free cash flow and the debt service, because this is actually the debt service, what I get as a final result? What is this final result? The free cash flow to equity that can be paid to equity holders. Free cash flow to equity. Free cash flow to equity. My question is, can I distribute all this amount of money to equity holders? The answer is, for a question of safety of lenders, the answer is no. Lenders require to keep part of this cash available to equity holders in special reserves. The first one is the debt reserve. So, before distributing dividends, bank requires some form of additional security. The first one is the debt service provision. Debt service provision. Debt service reserve provision. What is the debt reserve? It is a cash reserve. It is an amount of money that cannot be uh, swept out by the uh, shareholders, particularly in the first year of uh, operation. The debt service reserve is usually calculated as a certain number of months or a certain number of semesters of the debt credit of that year. For example, if you have a debt service in that year, debt service, sum of interest and repayment of, let's say, 60, and you ask for six months of debt reserve, you are asking 60 divided by 12 months times 6. Okay? So you ask for the coverage of a certain number of months of debt service. If you want to be more careful, you will ask a large number of months. If you want to be less careful, you will allow uh, shareholders to include in the debt reserve a lower amount of money. So the debt reserve is uh, basically debt reserve is basically the debt service time number of months required divided by 12. So I take the debt service for that year, I divide it for 12 months, I calculate the debt service for one month, and I multiply for the required level of debt service. Usually the debt service uh, reserve is kept at a certain maximum level. Once you have reached that amount, you can immediately sweep out all the excess cash. Okay? Yeah. Uh, the other reserve that often is required is the so-called O&M reserve. Provision. Again, it is a part of the cash that usually goes in the pockets of uh, shareholders that for safety reason is kept inside the bank account of the special purpose vehicle. O&M reserve is uh, particularly uh, used in sectors where plants are subject to extraordinary maintenance after a certain number of years. 
For example, the water treatment sector is a sector like this one. Every five years, for example, you have to make extraordinary maintenance on the plant. Lenders say, I'm not sure that at the end of the fifth year you will have money in order to make these extraordinary expenses. For this reason, I ask you to avoid to distribute dividends during the previous five years and to provide money into the reserve so to have at the end of the fifth year the amount of money necessary to carry out the extraordinary maintenance works. Okay? Sufficiently clear for you? Once you have coped with the fulfill, to, you have fulfilled uh, the uh, requirements of banks in terms of debt service reserve and O&M reserve provision, at this time, now you can easily distribute dividends. Okay? Very easy. Very easy. Now, guys, uh, let's go back to the problem of cash available higher than cash needed. If uh, we have uh, for 20 years of operation in the cogeneration one case such behavior of cash flows, we can uh, measure whether, uh, from a forecasting point of view, remember, we are still studying the cogeneration case. The cogeneration case is still on paper. Cogeneration one project doesn't exist apart on the papers we are analyzing. So everything we are doing now is ex ante. The project hasn't started yet. Okay? So we are trying to see if the project will be sustainable for 20 years. The idea is very simple. Instead of calculating the difference between the cash available, free cash flow, and the cash needed, that service, let's calculate the ratio between the two variables. Very easy. The ratio should be, should look like a ratio of this way. I take free cash flow for every year T of operation, for T going from one commercial operating day to 20, end of the project, and I divide it for the sum of interest on debt time T and the repayment of loans time T. Debt repayment, uh, sorry, capital repayment on time T, repayment, time T, plus interest, time T. If the project is financially sustainable, financially viable, this ratio should be for every, uh, for every year in the operation phase, for, the, for every one of the 20 years, higher than one. Yes, higher than one. This ratio is the first key ratio used for the analysis of the financial sustainability of a project finance deal. Look, this has nothing to do with discounting, with MPV, with IRR. It is simply what I have in terms of what I have to pay. And this ratio is called, uh, with an acronym, DSCR where DSCR stands for Debt Service Cover Ratio. Debt Service Cover Ratio. Okay? Sufficiently clear for you? Uh, debt Service Cover Ratio. Let's uh, make some uh, arguments on the Debt Service Cover Ratio. I go back to the suggestion of the colleague about the swing uh, in uh, the, some of the macro variables or uh, prices of crude or whatever you want. In your opinion, suppose to consider uh, two different sectors. For example, a PPP project, for example, the construction of an hospital, and uh, another kind of project, for example, the construction of an hotel and leisure facility. Okay? As a bank, as an arranger that is, uh, is mandated to uh, organize a, a syndication of this loan, in your opinion, in which of the two sectors will 
the required minimum level of that service cover ratio be higher and in which of the two will be lower and why? Remember, the, the higher the level of that service cover ratio, the higher the safety cushion for you because if this ratio is higher than one, this means that the numerator is much higher than the denominator. If this ratio is very close to 1, this means that the numerator and the, de and the denominator are, have uh, two values that are close one to the other. In which of the two sectors, uh, you as a bank, would require a higher level of debt service cover ratio? And in which of the two the lower? And why? Yes, in this case you have a risk that is not sufficiently covered and cannot actually be covered. We have a market risk here. Here we have counterparty risk, but if the public administration is sufficiently strong and the level of rating is appreciable, the market risk is not there. And also the counterparty risk is not there. So here we don't have market risk. No market risk. What we can say, all other things equal, is without going in more depth in other sources of risk, we should see that the public-private partnership hospital debt service cover ratio should be lower than the minimum debt service cover ratio required for the hotel and leisure facility. And in fact, if we look at the standard market practice, just to give you an idea of the range of the debt service cover ratio required, PPP is required usually depending on the facility that will be built, a debt service cover ratio ranging from one third to 135. On the other hand, hotel and leisure are rarely financed without asking debt service cover ratio in the range of 1.45, 1.5. minimum required debt service cover ratio. This means that in every year of my business plan, if there is one year where the debt service cover ratio falls below the minimum threshold, that project is not feasible. Although, guys, although, if I, if I am below 1.3 or 1.5 or 145, this doesn't mean that the project has no cash. If I am with a minimum of 1.3 and in one specific year the business plan is telling me 1.25, with 1.25 I'm not insolvent. I simply have less cash than expected. But if you want to set a safety cushion, this is not good news. I want to have a safety cushion of 30% more or 45% more than the debt service in the second case. If you are below this threshold, this is bad news for me. Not because the project is insolvent, but simply because there is less cash than expected. Okay? Sufficiently clear for you? Good. Uh, so, guys, uh, just to give you uh, some other indications about, about the debt service cover ratio, nothing more apart one thing. Uh, there are two requirements by the banks. Ex ante, always ex ante. First, every year I must see a debt service cover ratio that is higher than the minimum. The other covenant that is required is the average value of the debt service cover ratio. So I ask also another covenant. The value of the average of all the debt service cover ratio here by here must be above a certain minimum value. So we have to cope with two requirements. The first one is the minimum debt service cover ratio. Minimum the SCR. And the other one is the average debt service cover ratio. For example, try to explain me the, the rationale behind this requirement. Suppose that you are building up an hospital and your banks agree to include a financial covenant into the loan agreement according to which the minimum debt service cover ratio 
must be 1.30, but banks required an average. That service cover ratio, I repeat, it is the average, the simple average, of all the debt service cover ratios calculated for all the life of the project, 1.37. Which is the rationale of this uh, combination of two ratios? Which is the rationale behind? Yes. The idea is, I want to give a floor to the debt service, so I will not accept any here before 1.30, but I ask that at least one or more here present a value of debt service cover ratio that is higher than 1.30. Otherwise, the average cannot be higher than 1.30. The idea is, I prefer as a bank to have a project that performs in this way, in terms of debt service cover ratio, I can accept a minimum level of 1.30, but I want and I prefer that in some years the value of debt service cover ratio is higher than the minimum. This is another way of uh, giving another form of security, a safety cushion, to banks. I would not be very much attracted by a project that performs in this way for all the life of the project. Okay, so usually the standard packs into the loan agreement require a minimum debt service and an average debt service cover ratio. And both of the two must be fulfilled. The average debt service cover ratio is simply the average of all the debt service cover ratio calculated during the life of the loan. Very simple. Clear for all? Sufficiently clear? Okay, uh, just to give you an example, uh, I will show the calculation of the debt service cover ratio is really simple. It's really simple. But I want to show you a very simple example, just to give you an idea. Okay, the situation is uh, very easy, uh, and I will show you uh, Okay, the situation is this one. Let's enlarge a little bit. can then let you have, uh, if you want, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this Excel file, but it is very simple. Let's have a look. I have an outstanding loan of 150. The interest rate is 10%. It is fixed. It, is, it has been swapped between a floating interest rate and a fixed interest rate. And the debt reserve required is three months of debt reserve. Suppose that the project has 10 years of operation. I mean, Time zero is the end of the construction and one is the first year of operation. So we are looking only at the operational phase. In the second column we have the level of free cash flow that is derived from the business plan. The third column, look, is the percentage repaid. In project finance uh, we will see next time that it is unusual to use the standard the depreciation schedule you know uh, fixed uh, installments, uh, uh, fixed uh, repayments, because I have to adapt the dynamics of the repayment to the dynamics of the cash flows. So it is very useful to include into the input tables the percentage here by here that is repaid in terms of the loan. Once you have the percentage repaid, you can easily get the amount repaid. For example, 
if I have a 15% capital repayment to the first year and the amount of the outstanding loan is 150, you will repay the first year an amount of 22.5. Look. And again the second, the third. In the fourth year, since the cash flows are much more abundant, you can afford the possibility to reimburse a higher percentage of that. And that's why I repay a 25%. And in the final year, where I have 69.8, I can repay much more, not 15%, but <coughs> 30%. This is a tailor-made repayment schedule. I adapt the repayment according to the value of cash flows. Since you know from mathematical finance that the interest are always paid on the outstanding of the previous period, Let's have a look at the first year, I have 15, that is exactly 10% of the outstanding amount at the end of the previous period. In this way, I can calculate the debt to reserve, uh, sorry, the debt service. The debt service will be the sum of the capital repayment, 22.5, and uh, the interest paid, 15. So the amount of the debt service will be 37.5. Very easy. Now I can calculate the ratio between the two free cash flow versus debt service and calculate the debt service cover ratio it is 1.4 the first year it goes 144 in the second 142 the third 138 the fourth and 141 the fifth okay if i ask for example a minimum debt service cover ratio of 1.38 this project in this fashion is feasible hmm? sufficiently clear for all Good. Look also at the debt reserve provision 9.4. 9.4 has been calculated as, in our uh, calculation, as three months over 12 months. So the idea is take the value of the debt service, 37.5, divide it by 12, and multiply for the required number of months. You have to set aside money into the debt reserve. In this case, 9.4. And, obviously, the difference between free cash flow, debt service, and debt reserve provision will return the free cash flow to equity paid in terms of dividend. Okay? Quite clear for all? Very simple. Actually, it is very simple. Uh, one final remark is the second cover ratio. We can go very quickly on this. And then we can... We can, we can stop for today. The second uh, uh, ratio can be analyzed looking at this example. And this example tells us something of interest. Because he says, if we are at year number one, the first year of operation, Look at the uh, cash flows. The project goes on from time 1 to time 10. End of project. But the loan will be repaid much earlier. The final repayment uh, date of the loan is year number 5. You see there, uh, the loan is completely repaid at year number five, and of year number five, and 2005, and five, and of the loan. Okay? Now, uh, let's have a look to year number one, and of year number one, and of the first year of operation. 31st December, year number one. How much debt do I have to repay at the end of year one, which is the outstanding amount of loan existing at the end of year one? Look at the data. It is 127.5. So, at the end of year one, the outstanding loan, I mean the amount of debt that I still to repay to banks, is outstanding loan. 127.5 Okay? Good Now, 
Let's reason in this way. It is a, a paradoxical way of reasoning, but it is uh, very useful from a pedagogical point of view. Suppose that the banks, uh, obviously, the banks will get repaid this 127.5 loan <coughs> into the next five years. So they will get paid uh, this debt service, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth year. Now, suppose that, reasoning paradoxically, the banks come to me today and say, hey guy, you know the news, repay me in full today. Pay me everything today. I have to pay 127.5. Okay? What can I use in order to pay the bank loan? One, I have one debt reserve. I have 9.4 in cash. You see there? Okay. I have a debt reserve of 9.4. Debt service reserve <coughs> of 9.4 available. And this is cash. And what else I have? I can make this reasoning to, with the banks. Banks, I have this piece of cash. And I can leave you, if you want, the possibility to get all the free cash flows, two, three, four, five, that the project will be able to generate in the next four years. Take them. Obviously, their value at present is not the simple sum of these four flows. It is not, obviously, flow number two, three, four, and five. It cannot be 230.6, the sum of these flows. Because in finance, uh, time has value. What I can tell banks is, okay, I leave you the possibility to capture these four flows for their present value. And their present value will be exactly the present value of these first, second, third, and fourth flow discounted at a corresponding interest rate. I pay you 10%, I will discount at 10%. Very easy. 10%. If the sum of the present value of this four flow plus debt reserve is higher than outstanding, I can repay in full my creditors. It is very easy. If you want, I have calculated. Guys, pay attention to the example. It is one of the rare formula I use in this course. It is the sum going from 2 to 5 of what? Of the free cash flows generated by the project. Free cash flow times T. Discounted with 1 plus KD where KD is the cost of debt, power of T, plus debt reserve, because debt reserve is cash, and I have it, divided by the outstanding amount at time T. Outstanding at time T. What, look at the example. If I am at the end of year number one, I discount to present the second the third, the fourth, and the fifth value. This is the value that I can give to banks discounted to present. I sum the debt reserve of 9.4 and I divide for the outstanding amount of 127.5. Okay? I get the final result that you see in the final column of uh, our exhibit of 1.5 and uh, you see that the heading of the column is LLCR that is the name of this ratio it is the loan life loan life uh, the life of the loan remaining from now to the end of the final repayment cover ratio loan life cover ratio for Italians, servizio di copertura durante la vita del debito. Loan, life, cover, ratio. Again, 
which is the minimum acceptable value for loan life cover ratio, the threshold, the equilibrium threshold for a bank, will be, very easy, one. In this point, I have exactly the amount of money necessary to repay all the outstanding amount. For the same reasons why we don't ask for a, minus, a minimum, minimum level of one for the debt service cover ratio, for the same reasons I will ask a higher level. That is, again, in the same ranges of uh, the corresponding debt service cover ratio for either a PPP or, uh, let's say, private investment in innovation. Okay? So, strictly measure than one, much depending on the sector where the project is placed and uh, the quality of the, uh, let's say, uh, coverage of risk through the allocation of risk through conference. Okay? Sufficiently clear? Any question? Uh, okay, I think we can, uh, we can finish for now. Thank you very much. Uh, just one, uh, one remark. If you want, this is a very simple example, and you can build up your 